Greetings. It's 5.19 a.m. 7.11.2017, they say. Today I'm going to pick up reading uh, Michael Hoffman's work. They were white and they were slaves. And I think the value of all the work that he's done <clears throat> to cite all the white slavery over the centuries and specifically in America is so valuable because of what is being done in our day and it's it's been being done for some time I mean since the so-called civil rights movement <clears throat> Martin Luther King and uh, Rosa Parks and that whole fiasco making it out to seem like somehow us uh, white people are somehow the the problem in the world when the real truth is that it is us Israelites whom Yahweh as per his new covenant he promised in Jeremiah 31 33 has written his laws in our hearts therefore and I'm not talking every single solitary Caucasian Israelite person no there are plenty out there who will not hear cannot hear will not see cannot see as Paul states in Romans 9 but in general it is those of us whom Yahweh has through the blood of Christ in his new covenant written his laws on our hearts that love the truth who long for equity and justice and righteousness and because of this we are the biggest problem for those elites those powerful shadowy figures who have been ruling over the world through debt slavery, real human slavery, wars, and false religion that teaches lies about the God of the Bible and about his Messiah and about the message of the Bible. We pose and have for some time the greatest obstacle in their way of full world control because they have seen that it is far easier to herd all the other peoples of the world than it is to herd us and that is precisely why they have been for quite a long time doing all they can to commit the crime the sin of genocide against our people and they are causing further unrest by by pushing these ideas that it was us our fathers and grandfathers simple white European people that were the slave masters as opposed to them and their fathers and their grandfathers and I imagine the more of us that do this work and put in this time to not only discover the truth of 
history, but also more importantly, the truth of the word of Yahweh. That as that continues to happen, more of us will be set free and more of us can help our brethren to become free because this world would indeed and will indeed be a great wonderful place when our Lord returns and establishes his kingdom on this earth and it will be a kingdom of righteousness and equity and you know any country that does keep the laws of Yahweh is a good equitable country to live in and it is good for us to know how he expects a godly country people to live and he wants us to not be ignorant because what does he say my people perish because of a lack of knowledge so the political economy of the Industrial Revolution enslavement overseas would not prove sufficient for the disposal of all of Britain's surplus poor however the workhouse system instituted by such high church Tories as Sir Humphrey Mackworth flattered itself with the claim that the poor people of Britain were generally in the fix that they were due to their own folly and lack of virtue and that habits of thrift and industry could be instilled by imprisoning them in fortress like buildings thereby removing them from the perils of the press gangs the assize courts and the street where the propertied classes would have had to endure the spectacle of their starvation the public expenditure connected with the construction and operation of the workhouse system was a source of self-congratulation for the aristocracy now the white poor could starve slowly in privacy instead of publicly on the street with a sop to the conscience of the expectation that some might survive and learn quote generosity towards their betters unquote and quote virtuous habits unquote in the bargain in the year 1765 23 indigent children were placed in the care of the st. Clement Danes workhouse by January of the following year two had been discharged and 18 were dead in the same time period of 78 children placed in the care of the workhouse at Holborn 64 were dead of 18 children who entered st. George's Middlesex workhouse 16 departed in a coffin in the workhouse of the combined parishes of st. Giles in the fields and st. George's Bloomsbury the mortality rate for English children was 90 percent moving one contemporary observer to opine that placing children in the workhouse quote is but a small remove from slaughter for the child must die unquote one is reminded of the remark of the English legal scholar William Blackstone quote it is much easier to extirpate than to amend mankind as the workhouse was revealed to be a mansion of putridity a humane reform alongside scientific lines was called for and into the breach stepped the political economist Jeremy Bentham 
Bentham's philosophy viewed the workhouse, when properly in implemented according to the latest principles in pauper administration, and the panopticon principle of construction as the scientific management of poor whites. Bentham's supposed, supposedly humane model, panopticon workhouse, was even more tomb-like and regimented than its predecessors and amounted to the creation of a prison warehouse for the storage of that vexatious species of humanity, the white pauper. An expose of political economy appears in Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist in his characterization of the Bentham and Ricardo philosophers on the board of supervisors of a workhouse. <clears throat> in quotes, the members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men. And when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered, that poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poor classes, a brick-and-mortar elysium. They established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the workhouse or by a quick one out of it. They made a great many otherwise and humane regulations. From Oliver Twist, Penguin Classics Edition, page 55. In the last stage of management of the British poor, the factory system of white slavery was instituted. The horrors of which were defended with the argument that its alternative was either the workhouse or enslavement overseas. Inside the factory, death was by no means certain and self-respect conferred by the captains of industry. Wages and sustenance could be attained, obtained. Therefore, the factory system of white slavery was yet another mercy in the long history of mercifully substituting one form of enslavement of the British yeomanry for another and calling the process progress and the advancement of civilization. The advocates of all four of these systems of human organization have seldom argued that their merits in comparison with the way of life offered the people by a traditional culture of craft making and farming the land. To do so would be to compare the traditional rural existence of the white farmer and cottage handcraft worker with the modern organization of the white working class. In such an analogy the evils of the latter would be overwhelmingly obvious. Once land, the source of the independence of the British yeoman, had been removed, the resulting dependency attached to the white poor, the station of servility, a process whose groundwork had been laid with the jur juridical defeat of ancestral peasant land claims as a result of the establishment of the concept of villain tenure in the 12th century, the consequences of which evictions and enclosure were not experienced on a mass scale until the Stuart era. The attitude of the propertied classes towards the class of penurious whites created by the avarice of the aristocracy was expressed candidly by Joseph Townshend in his A Dissertation of the Poor Laws and by the Scottish magistrate Lord Braxfield in the 1793 trial of Thomas Muir. Muir had been arrested for the, in quotes, crime of advocating the right to vote for white working men. At his trial, 
Braxfield ruled that, quote, Mr. Muir might have known that no attention could be paid by Parliament to such a rabble, the white workers who had petitioned for voting rights. What right have they to representation? A government in every country should be just like a corporation. And in this country, it is made up of the landed interest, which alone has the right to be represented. John F. Mackerson, Bristol Transported, page 13. Before I continue, I hope that you are paying attention to these things that they're saying quite some time ago, 1793. And furthermore, give attention to the fact that, uh, as we read in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, how it was worded that all men being created equal, endowed by their crea creator with certain unalienable rights. What are those rights they list? What is that? Life, liberty, and property? No. The pursuit of happiness. What could be more abstract and malleable than such a term. <clears throat> so, Joseph Townsend argued both for the necessity of cheap white labor in boom econo economic times to relieve delicate rich people from the need to perform drudgery, as well as for the elimination of the white surplus poor through starvation during times of economic depression. In good economic times, Townsend claimed that it was only natural that there should be destitute white people, quote, so that there may always be some to fulfill the most servile, the most sordid, and the most ignoble offices in the community. The stock of human happiness is thereby much increased, while the more delicate are relieved from the drudgery, unquote. During economic downturns, Quote, some check, some balance is therefore absolutely needful, and hunger is the proper balance. Now, they're, they're speaking openly against whites at this time, saying things concerning the white poor class in Britain at this time, that, of course, it has been claimed by typically Jewish-led legal entities in, of course, the United States and abroad, Europe, that that is what us common whites from European ancestry, they're saying that that is the way that we view other races, blacks and Hispanics. You see, they're always going to play races against one another to achieve their own ends. They're always going to do it, and they're doing it now. And if people don't wake up from their stupor, if they don't stop living their selfish, self-indulgent lives, if they don't stop participating in the evils that is enslaving us all, it can only go back to this sort of philosophy against all men, and I would say most especially against whites. This plutocracy, plutocratic, ideology, systemized in the late 18th century, was not a new or minority view. It had been expressed before, but with more wit and cant. Now, what had previously been discussed only in councils of state and the drawing rooms of the aristocracy 
was printed in the open for public circulation and, appro and approbation from the high-born. They're doing that now, too, by the way, people. They're becoming more and more bold with what their plans towards us and their opinions about us are. Have you noticed? The ideas, uh-oh, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. The ideas of modernity and progress with their Benthamite view of tradition as a toxic encumbrance eclipse the customary restraints of mercantilism with every glimmer of the coming of the machine age. The doctrine of the inferiority of the white yeomanry and their expendability in the name of the cause of advancing civilization was formulated to a greater degree with the publication in 1978 of the Reverend Thomas R. Malthus, an essay of the principle of population, greatly expanded and revised into two volumes in 1803. Malthus argued, quote, it was pointless to provide relief for the poor because this was a futile exercise calculated simply to perpetuate their misery. He went further denying that the white poor had any right to relief. From Inglis, page 69. Malthus reasoned that as long as hungry whites received food from charity, they would continue having more children. Malthus demanded moral restraint, celibacy from impoverished married white couples who, because they were poor, had no right to have children, in his view. Their only moral course was self-extinction, and with their eventual demise as a class, so too would poverty be extinguished, according to Malthus. Moral restraint, he argued, could operate among the poor only with very inconsiderable force because the poor law removed the need for it. By offering allowances for children, abolish the allowances, and the poor who exercised moral restraint would then be rewarded if they had no more children than they could afford, or better, no children at all. English or Inglis, pages 70 and 71. Malthus provided the perfect solution to a problem which had long haunted the British ruling class, the surplus white population, who always presented the potential for revolutionary overthrow of the system of privilege. Their devaluation over the centuries, from valain to slave to pauper to felon, had now reached its nadir. Those not gainfully employed would be starved to death, all for the, quote, maximum good of society, end quote. The political economist David Ricardo also advocated the starvation of unemployed whites, quote, by engaging to feed all who may require food, you in some measure create <clears throat> an unlimited demand for human beings. The population and the rates, taxes, would go on increasing in a regular progression until the rich were reduced to poverty. English page 149 and 150. Now I find that amazing too, don't you? that today we will allow other poor of other races, blacks, Hispanics, to keep producing children and the state, and by the way, our taxes, mostly the whites being those who pay them, going to support that very thing. Now, I'm not saying that no one person has more of a right to life than another. But I am saying that uh, we should pay close attention 
to the fact that the aristocracy, the elites, they don't really ever change their views, per se. They simply just change tactics, and we always need to wonder why it is they're employing any certain given tactic, especially when they're employing it specifically against white people, as they're doing now. So, here was the raison d'etre of the machine age. The factory owners announced that they would take the white refuse, doomed to otherwise starve, and actually pay them. Thus was paved the way for the acceptance of factory slavery, celebrated as a mercy and the salvation of an otherwise bestial and valueless creature, the penurious white adult and child. If the assessment appears to place too great an emphasis on what in retrospect was merely a fleeting and aberrant 1790s dogma of an industrial revolution which quickly disabused itself of such extreme plutocratic thinking, one may cite a book written in 1990 by Clemson University economist Clark Nardinelli, which attempts to make the case that the worst crime of the Industrial Revolution, the enslavement, maiming, and death of five, six, and seven-year-old white children in factories was, quote, given the circumstances, a benefit, and an opportunity. Nardinelli's book has been hailed as a major achievement in the definitive history of the period of the Industrial Revolution. This recent work takes the same attitude towards white child slaves as their 18th century factory overseers. The views of the robber barons are being celebrated in the 1990s as the historically correct response towards poor whites. In defending the enslavement of white children in factories, the professor writes, quote, An idyllic childhood devoted to education and play was simply not possible for most white children. From Child Labor and the Industrial Revolution, page 156. One wonders what sort of reception Nardinelli and his university publisher would have received had he justified the enslavement of Negro children in the antebellum South on the basis that an, quote, idyllic childhood devoted to education and play was simply not possible for most black children. As we shall see, Nardinelli's Apologia is part of a long line of both capitalist and supposedly, quote, humanitarian socialist thinkers for whom two different standards of morality have obtained. What qualified as oppression of Negro slaves and what qualified as oppression for white ones. Beginning with the fact that it had been ruled improper, to even refer to white slaves as such, and concluding with economic arguments in favor of white enslavement, which, were they to be advanced in precisely the same terms towards any other race of people, would be denounced as an egregious denial of fundamental human rights. That such a denial of the rights of white laborer and the violence done to those rights is still current and influential 200 years after Bentham, Malthus, Ricardo, and Townshend illustrates the low status of white working and poor people even in our own time. One may here argue that child labor in factories, while repellent, was not slavery. 
Such an argument can only be based on a 20th century conception of a factory as a place merely of regimentation. The factories of the late 18th and early 19th centuries were very different establishments. Now, before I start on this next section, I do want to point out emphatically that those laws of Yahweh, those laws that he gave to Israel in the Torah, they would never allow for these things to happen. Never. Those laws that most preachers proclaim with great pride that we're no longer under because we're under grace, it is those very laws that would establish and allow for justice and equity to all men. These things that I just read about, these ways that this aristocracy took land from people and forced them into slums and factories, death camps, and so on, would never, ever have gotten by in Yahweh's nation under his laws. Ever. For those who would ignorantly say, yes, but he allowed slavery, you need to go back and read again. You need to find out what the caveats are. Have you ever noticed that he doesn't just mention his laws, he mentions his laws, his ordinances, his statutes, his judgments? Because with all his laws, he has ordinances, statutes, and judgments for how those laws are to be implemented, and by whom, and what are conditions for releases of such. That's why Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, because the law is good. The law does not allow for these things to happen. That is why a lawless nation is so corrupt and is such an evil, harmful place to live. Without Yahweh's laws in a nation, it's chaos. All right, the factory system. In 1830, the Reverend Richard Ostler, a Methodist minister in York, protested the conditions in the Bradford woolen mills where young children labored and were beaten if they fell asleep. Ostler attacked the hypocrisy of Yorkshire clergymen and politicians who condemned with great fervor the enslavement of blacks in the West Indies while in England, quote, thousands of our fellow creatures are this very moment in a state of slavery more horrid than are the victims of that hellish system, quote, colonial slavery, and the very streets which receive the droppings of an anti-slavery society are every morning wet by the tears of innocent victims at the accursed shrine of avarice, who are compelled, not by the cart whip of the Negro slave driver, but by the dread of the equally appalling thong or strap of the overlooker, to hasten, half-dressed but not half-fed, to those magazines of British infantile slavery, the worsted mills 
in the town of Bradford. Ostler was publicly thanked by a delegation of English laborers at a meeting in York for his many letters to expose the conduct of those pretended philanthropists and canting hypocrites who travel to the West Indies in search of slavery, forgetting there is a more abominable and degrading system of slavery at home. Cecil Driver, Tory Radical, The Life of Richard Ostler, page 36 through 55, English, page 260. The Industrial Revolution's factory labor force consisted primarily of white children from the workhouses who were seized and placed in the factories under a spurious indentured apprentice system. Here then was a ready source of labor and a very welcome one. The children provided with employment would be rescued from pauperism and the ratepayers, taxpayers, would be relieved of their part of the burden. So mill owners began to appear in London, visiting parish officers and making the necessary arrangements. The children were formally indentured as apprentices. What happened to them was nobody's concern. A parish in London, having got rid of a batch of unwanted pauper children, was unlikely to interest itself in their subsequent fate. The term apprenticeship was in any case a misnomer. English, pages 75 through 76 and 81. Quote, many employers imported child apprentices, parish orphans from workhouses far and near. Clearly, overseers of the poor were only too keen to get rid of the orphans. Children were brought to the factories like, quote, cartloads of live lumber, unquote and abandoned to their fate. Poor children, taken from the workhouses or kidnapped in the streets of the metropolis, used to be brought down by, coached to Manchester, and slid into a cellar in Mosley Street as if they had been stones or any other inanimate substance. Margar uh, Marjorie Cruikshank, Children and in Industry, pages 13 and 14. Being indentured, as, quote, pauper apprentices, unquote, children lost all ability to negotiate the terms of their bound labor. The term apprentice was a misnomer because they were not being taught a trade. Machine tending was a custodial function, not a skill. A child labored as indentured apprentice could be paid a pittance and forced to work the longest hours. For example, to induce free English adults to work a night shift at a factory would have cost the owners more in wages. These disadvantageous terms were avoided by compelling the enslaved children to work at night. British children comprised a majority of the factory workforce. Quote, from two-thirds to three-quarters of the workers in the early factories they were lucky if they earned a half penny an hour. For this they were made to work as children had never been made to work before. Inglis, page 104. For the sake of a shilling a week, at the age of five, children who had to be carried to work and who, once there, had to be terrorized to stay awake. Crookshank, page 20. White children worked up to 16 hours a day, and during that period the doors were locked. Children and most of the mill workers were still children, were allowed out only to go to the necessary. In some factories it was forbidden to open, <clears throat> um, thinking that's many or my, any, Sorry, in some factories it was forbidden to open any of the windows. Cotton fluff was everywhere, including on the children's food. But often, as they had to stand all day, they were too fatigued to have any appetite. 
The child apprentices who were on night shift might stay on it for as long as four or five years. Although they were provided with dinner at midnight, the machinery did not stop. Inglis, page 80, 163, 164, and 262. This was labor without any breaks, unceasing labor. When the children fell asleep at the machines, they were lashed into wakefulness with a whip alternately known as a thong or strap. If they arrived late to the factory, talked to another child, or committed some other infraction, they were beaten with an iron bar known as a billy roller. A contemporary witness described the factory children of Manchester, England as almost universally ill-looking, small, sickly, barefoot, and ill-clad. Edward Bain's History of the Cotton Manufacture, page 462. Francis Trollope, in the room they entered, the dirty, ragged, miserable crew were all active in the performance of their various tasks. The overlookers, strap in hand, on alert, the whirling spindles urging the little slaves who waited on them to movements as unceasing as their own. Michael Armstrong, Factory Boy. The essential feature of factory life as it developed in England was that the children were enslaved. English, page 104. Charles Shaw was a child laborer from the age of seven, beginning in 1839. When an adult, he wrote a book about his experiences. Quote, fortunes were piled up on the pitiless toilings of little children, and thousands of them never saw manhood or womanhood. Their young life was used as tillage for the quick growth of wealth. I have seen sights of sickening brutality. These little white slaves were flogged at times as brut uh, brutally, all things considered, as Legree flogged Uncle Tom. Nearly all England wept about thirteen years later for Uncle Tom especially the classes, but no fine lady or gentleman wept for the cruelly used English children when I was a child, 18, 22, and 65. White children in the early factories were sometimes beaten to death, killed by blows from overseers. Crookshank, page 51. Statement of Henry Dunn, quote, the overseer carries a strap. The boys are severely strapped. There was a tenter to every flat, and he was considered as a sort of whipper in to force the children to extra exertion. Seen wounds inflicted upon children by tenters, by Alexander Drysdale, among others, with a belt or stick were the first thing that came uppermost saw a kick given by the above-mentioned Alexander Drysdale, which broke two ribs of a little boy, helped to carry the boy down to a surgeon. <clears throat> the boy had been guilty of some trifling offense, such as calling names to the next boy. Testimony of Ellen Ferrier, factory worker, quote, When Charles Kennedy was the overseer, he licked us very bad, beat our heads, and kicked us very bad. English was different back then. Beat us, licked us, beat us. Testimony of Mary Scott Factory Worker, quote, was here with Charles Kennedy. Seen him strike Betty Sutherland. Can't tell how often, but it was terrible often. John Fortesque, an overseer in the Milne factory in Nottingham, England, gave the following statement. There are some children so obstinate and bad, they must be punished. A strap is used. Beating is necessary on account of their being idle. We find it out this way. We give them the same number of bobbins each. When the number they ought to finish falls off, then they're corrected. They would try the patience of any man. 
statement from a Mr. Grant, a Manchester factory worker, April 1833. A child not ten years of age, having been late at the factory one morning, had as a punishment a rope put round its neck, to which a weight of twenty pounds was attached, and thus, like a galley slave, it was compelled to labor. John C. Cobden, The White Slaves of England, page 121, 122, and 144 through 145. Statement by Reverend Ostler, London, 1833. In a mill at Wigan, the children, for any slight neglect, were loaded with weights of twenty pounds, passed over their shoulders, and hanging behind their backs. Then there was a murderous instrument called a billy roller, about eight feet long, and one and a half inch in diameter. Oh, I'm sorry, and one inch, yeah, and a half in diameter with which many children had been knocked down and in some instances murdered by it. From the Times of London, February 25, 1833. An unknown writer expressed the bitter feelings of the early British factory workers. I'm up but weary. I scarce can reach the door. And long the way and dreary, oh, carry me once more. To help us, we've no mother. To live how hard we try. They killed my little brother. Like him, I'll work and die. The overlooker met her. As to the frame she crept. And with the thong he beat her. And cursed her as she wept. Alas, what hours of horror made up her latest day. In toil and pain and sorrow, they slowly passed away. That night a chariot passed her, while on the ground she lay, the daughters of her master, an evening visit to pay. Their tender hearts were sighing, as wrongs to negroes were told, while the white slave was dying, who gained their father's gold from the Birmingham Journal, April 14, 1833. In Bleak House, Dickens was to satirize evangelical, quote, telescopic philanthropy, unquote, in the person of Mrs. Jellyby, a do-gooder so absorbed in the welfare of the African natives of Boreobula Ga that she fails to notice her own family sinking into ruin. This was precisely Carlyle's point. With Irish dying in ditches, it was the worst sort of rose-pink sentimentalism to worry oneself about West Indian Negroes. Eugene R. August, Introduction to Thomas Carlyle's The Nigger Question, Croft's Classic Edition, page... 17. In the late 1830s, William Dodd began his exhaustive research into the condition of the English poor. He estimated that in the year 1846 alone, 10,000 English workers, many of them children, had been mangled and mutilated by machinery or otherwise disabled for life. They were abandoned and received no compensation of any kind. Many died of their injuries. Among factory children themselves, many suffered from scrofula, incipient consumption visible by the enlarged neck glands and white swellings of the joints. At best, children who survived into adolescence outgrew the disease, though the deformities, the deformities themselves persisted. In some cases, however, limbs had to be amputated, and at worst, children worked until they died. Cruikshank, page 30. Young children are allowed to clean the machinery, actually while it is in motion. 
and consequently the fingers, hands, and arms are frequently destroyed in a moment. I have seen the whole of the arm from the tip of the fingers to above the elbow chopped into mincemeat, the cogwheels cutting through the skin, muscles, and in some places through the bone. In one instance, every limb but one was broken. William Dodd, The Factory System Illustrated, page 21 and 22. Accidents were often due to children being set to clean machinery while it was still in motion. The loss of two or three fingers was not exceptional. There were more serious accidents, such as the, that reported by a Stockport doctor in 1840 of a girl caught by the hair and scalped from the nose to the back of the head. The manufacturer gave her five shillings. She died in the workhouse. Cruikshank, page 51. 19th century factory worker William Dodd stated, quote, Petition after petition has been sent to the two houses of Parliament, to the Prime Minister and to the Queen, concerning this unfortunate class of British subjects, but without effect. Had they only been black instead of white, their case would have been taken into consideration long ago. The Reverend Charles Edwards Lester, the great-grandson of the Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards, and later the American consul in Italy, stated that if he had a choice between having his children born Negro slaves in the South or poor people in England, he would choose the former. I would sooner see the children of my love born to the heritage of southern slavery than to see them subjected to the blighting bondage of the poor English operative's life. From Lester, The Glory and the Shame of England, Volume 1, page 8. <clears throat> John Randolph of Roanoke traveling in England and Ireland with his black manservant, Johnny, wrote to a friend back home, Much as I was prepared to see misery in the south of Ireland, I was utterly shocked at the condition of the poor peasantry between Limerick and Dublin. Why, sir, John never felt so proud of being a Virginia slave. He looked with horror upon the mud hovels, and miserable food of the white slaves, and I had no fear of his running away. From Cunliffe, page 6. Lest Americans imagine that such practices never darkened our shores, readers are referred to the documentary literature on white child labor in American factories, especially Markham, Lindsay, and Creel's Children in Bondage, Ruth Holland's Mill Child, and Lewis Hines' Photographs of Child Labor. By 1801, Samuel Slater's factory, one of the first built in America, employed over a hundred children. The oldest was ten. The youngest was four. Theophilus Fisk a Connecticut publisher and Jackson Democrat, is ranked as one of the major leaders of the early U.S. labor movement. Fisk denounced wealthy white campaigners for Negroes' rights, and in 1836 gave what has been described as a, quote, fierce anti-abolitionist speech, unquote, in South Carolina. Fisk's anger derived from his observation that white slavery has been ignored. Fisk, quote, found that America's slaves had pale faces. And as abolitionism grew in Boston, 
called for an end to indulging sympathies for blacks in the South and for, quote, immediate emancipation of the white factory slaves of the North, from Rodiger, page 75. Charles Douglas, president of the New England Association of Farmers, Mechanics, and Other Working Men, described the 4,000 white children and women at work in the factories of Lowell, Massachusetts in the 1860s as dragging out a life of slavery and wretchedness. These establishments, New England's factories, are the present abode of wretchedness, disease, and misery. Ruth Holland, commenting on the participation of New England factory owners in the cause of abolitionism and rights for Negroes in the South, observed, quote, it's a little difficult to believe that northern mill owners, who were mercilessly abusing white children for profit, felt such pure moral indignation at Negro slavery. From Millchild, page 28. And that's where I wrap up today. I hope this has empowered you, and I hope that it has given you pause for thought. I hope you will consider many things as you reflect on this information that I have just given you. And I hope you will consider these things when reading the prophecies for Israel in the last days. Yahweh says, I will gather you from all the nations in which you've been enslaved, do you really, really believe that you're not enslaved? Because if you do, you're still asleep. Until next time, <clears throat> I pray you do well. Goodbye.